everyone to the final session of this year's QCTIP conference. Uh, we have one invited talk in the session and then some closing remarks. So please don't leave just uh, when the talk finishes. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Mario Zedidi from Alibaba, and he's going to be telling us about the Alibaba Cloud Quantum Development Platform, a QAOA experiment. Mario, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, and I would like to join uh, to the other participants thanking the organizers for, for keep, the, keep this event going. It's a wonderful event and I am honored to speak here. Um, so the first part of my talk is going to be about the Alibaba Cloud uh, Quantum Development Platform. And in the second part, I will um, talk about a little experiment about QAOA using the platform. So the platform um, <clears throat> is, a, is a computing engine um, like all groups that develop quantum computers need such a platform. Um, so our platform uh, is being built for the past maybe one and a half, two years. Um, it's, a, it's a computing engine which uh, computes discrete uh, simulation. Uh, so the, the, the simulates systems like discrete systems, like it cannot do Schrodinger evolution, but it can simulate uh, quantum circuits or error models or compute Hamiltonians. Um, so the main idea, which actually is not our idea, but it's, it's a well-known idea that we represent a quantum circuit as a tensor network. Um, and, um, so most of the operations, most of the tasks are uh, on to contract the tensor network. Um, now, what's, what's good about our capabilities is that we can distribute um, our computation on uh, over 100,000 CPU cores, so that of course gives uh, significant compu computing powers. Um, now the applications that has been implemented or that we intend to implement uh, include uh, quantum algorithm design um, and then the face, uh, characterization, verification, validation triple. So characterization is when we compute the effect of control operations on a system verification is when we check whether the uh, actual operation is close to the desired ideal operation. And validation is what computer scientists actually call verification, which let's say, um, well, if it's factoring, then you can easily verify the result because then you just multiply together the factors and see whether it's the input number. But, but validation can be quite tricky, like for instance, for the Google supremacy circuit to validate that indeed it does what it has to do. So validation is um, like a computationally expensive uh, undertaking that so our platform also intends to do. Um, and so then we can also do quantum error correction. And there is a recent result where my colleagues are, are just doing that. Um, <clears throat> let me just go to the next slide. Um, so as for a simulation, like we have been doing it again since um, Google's bristlecone circuit. I mean, we started before uh, and so my colleagues I have simulated that um, starting at depth 28, but they could go up to depth 40. And we see that the time per amplitude um, is like 580 seconds, which is not that bad at all. So I want to mention that these are projected running times, meaning the computation was not done I mean, the entire computation was not done, but enough parts of it were done. So all the other parts are just the same, but more. So 
uh, so it's easy to project how much time it would take. And then like a more recent result is when we are simulating the Google Sycamore circuit with depths uh, 14. So the actual supremacy circuit is, I think, depths 20. Um, and, but even depths 14, it already takes, as you see, um, like in the order of, of, of days. Um, and again, so, so in order to get these running times, you have to run the software on the Alibaba cloud. Okay, so now let me talk a little bit about the, the, the let's look under the hood. Um, so the main engine is a tensor network contraction engine. So when you have a tensor network, then you have to decide that the contraction order for the edges and depending on the contraction order, uh, your computation can be, I mean, the running times are very, it can be very different. So you had better find a, a good contraction order. At least the best contraction to find the best is NP hard. So most algorithms are aimed at finding a good enough order. But we have yet another uh, resource at our disposal, um, which is that we can make an edge in this tensor network disappear. But of course, if it is a price, which is that then we have to double the instance. So we have to create another instance or, or maybe triple or uh, so. But if we have a distributed setting, then that's okay because then we can just send the two instances to two different processors. So, so we can split split and so forth. So, <clears throat> so our algorithm is that first, uh, we look at the, net, the tensor network N, and then we start to split it. Actually, that happens at a single site. Um, and so we split it like 26 times, kind of greedily, like we look at which edge is the most advantageous to split. And then we just go on until we split, I think typically 26 edges. And so once we have this, well, two to the 26 instances, but, but simpler networks, then we just send it out to the nodes. Now, you see that we don't have two to the 26 edges, uh, nodes, but it's still advantageous, uh, like to have so many copies because the copies are smaller and there is also a space limitation. Okay, so that ends the first part of my talk. Um, so this was roughly the structure of our engine. And so let's now talk about QAOA. Uh, so QAOA, so there was like a little study I have done in the past couple of months. Um, um, so you will see, okay, so, so QAOA is, but I think most of you know, it's a quantum approximate optimization algorithm developed by Farhi, Goldson, and Gutman. And so the aim of this algorithm is to solve uh, optimization problems like the max cut of a graph. Now this is an NP-hard problem, but we hope to gain some quantum advantage uh, solving this problem. Okay, so now let me just give you a very brief introduction into QAOA. So again, the goal is to compute max cut, but physicists look at max cut as energy. Um, so an energy of a certain Hamiltonian, which you will see in the next slide. But so what, what happens is that, um, so first we build like an n qubit quantum state and um, the, um, <clears throat> so that n qubit quantum state is gonna be created by a circuit, uh, the structure of which uh, mimics the structure of the instance. So here on the picture, you see how it mimics it, like it's a two level circuit. The circuit also has a set of parameters, like two parameters for each level and so once you have all this, so the circuit with the parameters, then it creates a quantum state. 
And so now we have a, the Max, the cut Hamiltonian, which is, um, so you have n qubits, like each of the qubit is representing whether like a node is in a cut or not. And so the Hamiltonian is a two to the n by two to the n matrix. And actually it's a classical problem. So it's a diagonal matrix. And what you see in the diagonal is the, is the cut size for those particular cuts. But we transformed it a little because the cut is a maximization problem. And so in physics, you minimize energy so we take the number of edges minus the cut, but this is just the technical detail. So this way one is the good number and three is the bad number. So if you have three nodes all on the same, all with the same color, no edges is cut. So this is a terrible cut. And so the number is three. If one node is on one side and two are on the other, then only one edge, there is only one edge which is uncut. So that's a, that's a great number. So we are looking to minim, we are looking at minimal diagonal entry. So that's a Hamiltonian energy minimization problem. So again, we have this cut Hamiltonian and then we have the QAOA circuit which creates a state. And so the energy of this state, which again, the energy depends again on this circuit, which in turn depends on the graph and the angles, so, so there is this energy value and that's called the QAOA energy. Um, okay, so once um, like the angles and uh, so the G is given, then well a quantum computer could, could, well we can compute this energy, well we have to actually run the circuit a few times, but we can compute this, at least approximate this energy in polynomial time. Whereas when we classically simulate, we cannot say the same only for very special graphs, like very sparse graphs, um, uh, with bounded degree and um, so forth. So, um, but in quantum, you can conceivably compute this QAOA energy. Um, so now, but in the rest of the talk, I am gonna talk about the, a new twist because I just like to do some creative things with things, not just, you know, as they are. So I, so I, I decided to use this QAOA energy in a different ways namely tried it on the graph isomorphism problem. So the graph isomorphism problem, let me just give a couple of uh, slides to advertise it. So uh, of course, all of you know, so are these two graphs isomorphic or not? So are they are the same modulo permuting the nodes? Um, and so the problem itself is not just, uh, so, so sorry, so the problem is, is a yes, no problem. So you, are two, you have two input graphs and yes, if the two graphs are isomorphic, so there is a permutation that takes G1, G2 and no, if there is no such permutation. Um, now the, the graph isomorphism problem is not just a, like a standalone problem, but actually it's known that there are several problems uh, that are equivalent to it. So vertex colored graph isomorphism problem, uh, string isomorphism problem, and so forth, like even some group theoretical problems like coset intersection problems and so forth. So these were pointed out by, by Lux, who has the first beautiful result in, in the direction of graph isomorphism and others. Um, so, um, <clears throat> Now, another advertisement is that, of course, people have been trying graph isomorphism with quantum, although most attempts failed, or all attempts failed, actually. Um, so, but one brand of attempts is exactly like my attempt, that they start from the two graphs, they create something quantum from the two graphs and compute something 
quantum and then see if those two numbers agree. And so that's what I am going to do. I am just uh, going to check if the QAO energies are the same. Um, now, <clears throat> if the two graphs are isomorphic, then, well, it's very easy to see that then the, well, when we fix the same beta and gamma angle sequences, then the QAO energies must be the same. But of course, the big question is that what if they are not isomorphic? Are they different? Are the energies different? And I do believe that the energies will be different from random beta and gamma, but it's not only the question whether they are different, but if they are different enough to actually to, re, uh, to notice. So whether the gap is, is big enough. Okay, so I did like, I could separate actually lots of graphs with this method, like in particular all 40,000 three regular graphs on 18 nodes can be separated with depths for QAOA and so forth. So these are like two sort of famously hard graphs. Um, it's a breeze, it's, a, it's an easy, it's easy to separate with QAOA energies. Um, but, and, so, and so actually you can even draw a landscape of all, for instance, three regular graphs. Like these are all the 4,060 three regular graphs. Now, just as a digression, um, like you see that if you do the one level QA, which distinguishes um, the least between all the graphs, then you see some interesting phenomenon, namely that the graphs cluster into just according to just a single parameter. So I looked at what that parameter was, and it turns out that that parameter was the number of triangles. So I got this triangle theorem where I actually, I could compute the QAOA energy of a graph merely as a uh, function of the number of triangles, of course, also the function of the number of nodes. Um, Okay, so now if you go back to that landscape, which I am not going to do, so all the 4,060, almost all 4,060 three regular graphs are going to be separated at level three. There are only two three regular graphs that stick together. Actually, they are separated at depths four, which is these two graphs, the Möbius uh, circular ladder and the cir circular ladder. So I started to think that maybe these are actually counterexamples to the proposed graph isomorphism algorithm, and indeed they seem to be. So as the size, as their size grows, the energy gap seems to be exponentially smaller and smaller. Um, but then that actually in conjunction with another amazing observation, which is that the, um, that, so if a graph has a bad pair, like the circular ladder has the Möbius ladder, which is like where the, this energy difference is very tiny, then that can only happen, according to my experiment, I cannot prove it, but, but all evidence is suggest that the energy landscape of the G itself ought to be like super flat, like there is like a very tiny variation on the energy. Basically, if it's exponentially small, then the energy landscape has only exponentially small variation, var variance, I am sorry. Um, and so I asked my colleagues to indeed to check with, my, with our a QAOA solver, which is also in our platform, uh, that so can they find the max? Okay, so if the, I'm sorry, I, I, I skipped a step. So if the energy landscape is flat, then you cannot optimize well. So I, I asked them to optimize over the circular ladder. 
and this is what they got that for 14 plus 14 nodes circular ladder actually the optimum they found 21 is 21 which where the true optimum is 42 so it's half and I, and it's not an accident because actually 21 is what you just get by randomly labeling the nodes so for some reason it was indeed hard to optimize but then uh so i asked to do another three regular bipartite graph on 14 plus 14 nodes and that was also similarly hard to optimize although i i gave them a graph which is was like two cycles connected with the random matching so it has some similar structure so i'm yet to investigate whether it's like all of these are hard to optimize or just i mean or indeed there is something to my theory in any case so uh, by the way our uh, qaoa uh, platform uh, component has like it's plugged to five optimizers and and this one was used the lbfgsb um because the others couldn't even i mean they just ran too long okay so um so let let me draw conclusions um so we have this platform and so i used that platform and actually my own programs uh to develop these graph isomorphism ideas um now i'm very excited about this research just because qaoa is interesting mathematically uh regardless of, of what i'm not sure that it will solve like hard combinatorial optimization problems but it's very interesting mathematically but so in any case the above findings back for theoretical justifications uh which should be nice mathematics and i my article just hints a little bit how i would approach it but but it's still wide open. Well, thank you very much. Uh, this concludes my talk. Um, and now I am looking for the next step. Thank you, Mario. I'm gonna be asking you some questions that I'm gonna be taking from Slack. Sure. Uh, uh, a reminder that uh, we are in the session 12, talk one, ZD Slack channel. So we will start with a question by Brandon Bright, he's asking, is there any significance in these found optimums arriving at roughly half of the true optimum? Or is this an obvious point I missed? Well, it's, so why it's exactly half? Well, it's, the point is that the optimizer failed. The optimizer badly failed because it just, it did not do any better work than just the simple random labeling of the nodes. So that's the point. That there is no other significance to that. I see. I have a question myself. Can you say a bit more about uh, this trick by which you can cut one uh, contraction in your tensor network and uh, end up computing twice as many? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So think about like, multiplying two matrices. Let's say you want to multiply two 10 by 10 matrices. Like that, let's say Aij times Bjk. So the common running index is J. Now you split through J, which means you freeze J. So if you freeze J, like let's say you set J to three, then you end up with the problem of A i3 times b3 j so you get a rank one matrix but like a rank one matrix so that's gonna be one of the 10 instances that you get this 10 this rank one matrix now this is a little clumsy example because it's not a closed tensor network and also you don't see the immediate advantage but the rank one matrix is easier to compute and, and it's just a tensor product of, of two rank uh, of two. So 
So this is how you split. You just freeze the index and the split edges and and then and then you just get a new tensor network. Thank you. That's very clear. Yeah. Uh, question uh, from Matthias Rosenkrantz. How does your flat optimization landscape relate to the one of the to, to the Byron plateau results? Both seem to share exponentially small variance, making it hard to optimize. Yeah, so I've seen that bottom plateau result. So I am yet to, you know, to investigate the relation between the bottom plateau result. Okay. This comes from, so this is for these particular graphs, which have pairs, whereas the the result is for different graphs. All right, so uh, yeah, final question from Jacinta May from Microsoft Station Q. Have you been able to compute the QAOA values for graphs with a higher depth than four? Well, so this 14 um, plus 14 node graph, which was the circular ladder, uh, so my colleague computed it with depths eight. But in my exp in most of my experiments, I just used my software, which has a limitation on the number of nodes. But then I just did the state evolution, and then you can just do arbitrary depths because with state evolution you can just do arbitrary depths. But with the tensor network, well, this was depths eight. It took quite a quite a lot of time to to do it. Thank you. There's a couple more questions in Slack, if you would be so kind to uh, answer them over there. And sure. 